Hi everybody, my name is Mike Schneider and I'm a professional fingerboarder. I decided to do a Q&A session on my Instagram where people ask some really cool questions and I'm excited to answer them all for you. So, many of you already know who I am, but if you don't, um, basically I'm a fingerboarder, professional, I've been doing it for over 20 years. I own my own company called Flat Face Fingerboards and I do all kinds of fingerboard events and videos and I've just been doing my best to help the scene grow and get fingerboarding to be as big as it is today. Alright, so we're going to go here on Instagram and check out all these questions you guys have asked. That's a lot of questions. I'm going to actually answer as many as I can. Whoa, there's so many I haven't seen, what the heck? There's 200 questions. This is a good one. Alright, we're just going to start out with this. What's your favorite Spongebob episode or moment? <laughs> so, I love Spongebob. You guys have probably seen a lot of my old videos where I had the TV in the background and Spongebob was always on. So, I don't know if I have a favorite moment, but I have to say seasons one and two, like every single moment. If you go back and watch those, they're pure gold. What do you think was the best innovation in fingerboarding? I think wooden decks probably. I mean, going from plastic tech decks to wooden boards where we could make them just a little bit better and then a lot better, I think has kind of changed a lot. But bearing wheels is a close second because, yeah, they both improve your performance and feeling so much. So it's kind of hard to choose, but yeah, I think both the decks and the wheels just becoming such high quality that they're exactly like a real skateboard. Who was your favorite fingerboarder growing up? I was really influenced a lot by like Elias, Nick, Winkler, um, Danny Rodriguez, uh, Chris Daniels. A lot of the older people that were really good were like very influential for me. Why do you ride 32 trucks on a 34 instead of 34 trucks? I don't really like the 34 trucks that much. For me, like they're too wide. They just kind of like slow down everything. So I like the 32 trucks and my boards are 33.6 millimeters, and I find that it just fits really good. You just have like just barely any overhang, or if you use like G4 wheels, it pretty much fits perfectly because they're kind of wider anyways. So yeah, I just find like a little better performance when my board's like the tiniest amount bigger than the trucks. If you could bring back to life an OG brand, which one would it be? Um, yeah, I was thinking about this one. There's a few awesome ones, but I'm going to have to go with Arctic which somebody said right here too. So yeah, I think Arctic for sure. That was just like an awesome brand, like a lot of creativity behind it and like a good team and all the things that kind of just like make you excited, you know? Back in the day, like having a team and putting out team videos is huge because it's like you're waiting for this video to come out and everybody's filming for like, I don't know, a long time, like months at least for their parts and then it's like you're seeing the best of their best and it's everybody, it's the whole team, it's the whole brand, the whole vibe, everything's coming together and then so yeah those team videos combined with like good products like they were like some of the nicest wooden boards back in like 2005 or so which now it's very easy to find a nice wooden board there's a ton of people doing it but back then it was like anything good really stood out because there wasn't much of it you know everything was really like rudimentary just beginning so yeah they always brought a lot of excitement for sure in the early days yeah this is a great one do you still feel interested in fingerboarding after 20 years I do every single day even if I just touch it for a few minutes this thing is so much fun um, it's just the feeling you know it's like I love skateboarding and I love fingerboarding and it just like it just feels super good to do tricks even basic tricks and then when you have all kinds of different obstacles or you make something new or you think of a new trick or you watch a skate video and you get hyped on it like it's just endless fingerboarding has never gotten boring for me and I think it just like stays exciting you know there's some times when it's like you might fingerboard a little bit less for a little while but you're still having fun every single time you touch it and then like something comes along and reignites the interest like 120%. So it's not like you're getting bored and thinking like, oh, I'm done. It's like, no, you're always enjoying it. And then sometimes you're like really, really enjoying it. It's like so much fun. And then if you ever get bored or something, try to find an event by you or find some fingerboarders you can meet up with. 
because fingerboarding with people definitely helps keep it really exciting just kind of like challenging each other a little like you know you see your friend do like kickflip back tail and you're like dude why don't you do kickflip back tail three shove out or something i know you got it i've seen you do back tail three shove so like having people to kind of bounce off back and forth like get a little more creative and kind of like up your game and stuff it just keeps it exciting in that way too how much do you make a year from fingerboarding um i get paid like 60 dollars for each kickflip that i land so you know i'm kind of like raking in the cash real fast i just kind of wake up and just do kickflips all day <laughs> no uh i mean you don't get paid for fingerboarding really like you might get um you might get like a tv appearance or something like that that might pay you a little bit but i mean Professional fingerboarding is like more for fun. It's not like a living, you know? Yeah, my favorite music. Um, I don't know. I like a lot of music, a lot of different types of music. Uh, when I was like a kid, I always listened to like Metallica and Pink Floyd like in my parents' cars and stuff. So I really love that stuff too. But I usually go for more like electronic and like chill music and instrumentals especially because i don't know what people are saying like ever so words don't really do it for me that much so yeah like anything that sounds cool really like it depends on the mood you know like if you watch my videos i use all kinds of different music some of it's completely a joke but some of it i really like a lot too and i pretty much appreciate almost every type of music it just kind of depends like what the mood is and if it's well done and stuff like that it's like yeah there's there's a lot of good music out there, but some kind of probably like electronic with like deep bass. That's what I like. Like get a good subwoofer and really enjoy the bass. Favorite band. You all know Black Mouth Super Rainbow is one of my favorites. Um, it has been for a long time. Then I kind of stopped listening to them. Then I got back into them again. So they're really cool. They've got just like a one of a kind feel. Um, I really like Tycho. I think a big thing for enjoying music is like if you can't see it live, you need to listen to it loud and with the really good speakers, like it makes a huge difference. So you can really hear like what goes into all the intricacies and the sounds and stuff, really vibe with it. How do you determine which size deck you want to use? Um, basically I've been fingerboarding for a long time and I use a little of everything and I kind of see like what do I keep going back to, um, what boards have I done like kind of my best fingerboarding with and it's always like the G15 is just for me. The G15 deck, which is 33.6 millimeters, is just perfect for me because it just feels like it's that perfect spot of like, it's kind of wide, but it's not too wide and it just performs really well. So whatever feels good for me really, but it might be different for you. So try out different boards and see what you like too. What's your favorite food? Sushi. I love sushi. Uh, I also love burgers a lot. Uh, but I think sushi is the winner, like really good raw sushi, tuna, salmon, stuff like that. When you get that really good flavor, spicy tuna, yeah. Um, if you're still an infant, you shouldn't eat raw fish yet. <laughs> an infant? Yeah. I think if you're even like a child. What is something you think that shouldn't have changed in fingerboarding? What do you miss from the past? Um, forums. Forums were the best. Um, it kind of moved to like Instagram and stuff, which a lot of stuff is going on in there, but I don't know how to find it. And it's, yeah, it's hard to like search for things from the past on Instagram. So it's like, it's a cool platform in the moment, but it's not a good platform for like looking back and like what somebody tried really hard on like two years ago. So like forums were better um, for conversation, for documentation, stuff like that. And then YouTube is the same, like YouTube is great because you can go back and watch you can see my videos from like 2006, 2007 when I started posting them on there and like you can easily search and you can find all the great videos that you watched when you were younger, like all the ones that inspired me, I'll go back and watch them sometimes and it's really cool. But if they were just on Instagram, it would be like impossible to find. Yeah, it's just even a few years ago, like good luck finding something. So yeah, I miss the forums, the sense of community that the forums would give and yeah, just like the abundance of YouTube videos. There's still a lot, but there's like more on Instagram now and they get a lot of views on Instagram. So it's kind of like people are moving over to there. So keep it on YouTube. Um, keep things like findable, you know? Dang, yeah, it's super important to look into the past. You know, you have to know like what, 
how did you get here, even if it was before you? Like, how did things get to where they are? It's, like, really good for your perspective on everything. And it can even help you, you know, see where things are going to go next. All right, next question. Are you based slash red-pilled? So, uh, if you don't know, like, red pill is, like, from the Matrix, where it's, like, you can take a blue pill or a red pill, and the red one is, like, you get, like, infinite knowledge or, like, special, like, all the knowledge, something like that. So, um, I think asking a person a question like this is kind of, like, I don't know, using labels in general for people is not really that good because it kind of puts people into this box, and it's, like, nobody's really in any box, first of all, but... I think if somebody were to say that they were spiritually enlightened of any sort like that, they probably just have an ego problem because like we're all just learning forever, you know? We never know it all. We're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to improve as people. We're always going to understand others more the longer we're on this planet together and stuff like that. So there's no, there's no time when somebody just has it all or knows it all or feels it all, you know? You have to just enjoy life and like always be open to knowing that you don't know everything that you don't um you're not always going to be correct or you're not always going to be right about things and that's a good thing you know it's, it's like that's what lets you learn and become a better person so yeah what's your dream setup easy right here i made it <laughs> uh flat face g15.12 i also like the g15 regular shape so both either one of those this is the point twelve, which has a lower concave from the G12, and I got G4 wheels on it, Black River trucks, extra smooth tape, uh, flat face bushings, and yeah, it's my dream setup, and I made it, which is really crazy. I mean, I didn't make all the parts, but I made the board and the wheels, and my friends made the trucks, so like, it's, it's crazy. It's really cool. How do you see the future of fingerboarding? How did the scene change, and where will it go to? So, yeah. It's really cool because when I started fingerboarding, there wasn't much of a scene at all. There were some people on like Tech Deck forums and then RZF forums and then FFI, and there was there was no events. There was only really small companies, and then and then over time, um, you know, I threw together some events and people actually showed up, and it started growing a lot. And now fingerboarding is huge. There's events everywhere. Everybody sees an event somewhere and they're like, oh, cool, how can I do that in my area? I want to do one too. And like every single city has like a lot of fingerboarders in it now. And the internet has kind of connected us all. So the fingerboarding community is growing huge. And there's contests and events and online contests and all kinds of cool stuff. So it's really cool. And then products have been improving too. Like, the stuff we have now is more realistic than ever before, more functional, um, super high performance, so we can do like crazier tricks, more realistic and easier and stuff like that. In terms of where fingerboarding is going, um, I think it's going to continue to grow because it's been growing every single year and a lot of people have been getting back into it too from the early days lately, so that's really cool to see. And yeah, I think it's just going to keep growing. It's becoming more accepted in, like, the skateboarding community because a lot of pro skaters are like, yeah, I've been fingerboarding the whole time. Like, you know, they didn't always show it or whatever, but now people are just like, yeah, it's cool to do whatever you want to do. So, yeah, fingerboarding is definitely more accepted these days, more well-known, and it's just a cool thing you can do. What is the meaning of life? Look at the shirt. <laughs> it's from Skadash Dies, by the way. Go check him out. Uh, the meaning of life. I would be crazy if I told you that I knew, but if I had to pretend that I knew just for to say something, uh, the meaning of life is pretty much like to have fun, love people, love the things you're doing, enjoy all the feelings and the vibes, go travel, eat good food, sleep a lot, not too much, but get like good quality sleep, you know? Um, eat good, not just tasty, but eat healthy foods because you'll feel really good, like your body will do better and you'll feel nice. Um, and yeah, just do what you love, you know? Do what you love and be nice to other people and try to leave things a little better than you found them. What's your favorite Black Mouth Super Rainbow song? Everything on Dandelion Gum, for sure, like 
just about every song on that album is awesome. Um, I can't really pick just one, maybe Sun Lips or Drippy Eye. Um, and then Eating Us is also a really good album. And there's an instrumental version of the album which you can get, which is really cool. But yeah, both of those albums for sure. What's your favorite skate brand? Definitely Black River. They've taken their little town in the middle of nowhere in Germany and made it into a skateboard paradise. And if you ever have a chance to go there, you definitely should. It's so cool. Uh, they made tons of skate parks. Uh, they introduced me to loose trucks and wider boards and stuff, which really made skateboarding feel a lot better and just kind of like flow more. And yeah, they're just, they're really influential both in skateboarding and fingerboarding. So I'm going to say Black River Skateboards. Do your parents run your business for you? No, they do not, but they do help a lot. I hired them when I got too busy. Um, the orders were coming in faster than I could handle. And I was like, I need somebody to help me package these up and send them out and stuff like that. So I hired my parents like before I even graduated high school. And we've been working together ever since. So it's been going really well. They're amazing. They're super supportive. So yeah, definitely if you're running a business and you're kind of struggling to keep up, you should definitely hire somebody, whether it's family or friends, find somebody that you really, really trust and lay things out in the beginning so you know how you know what kind of boundaries there are, who does what, what's important, what can be done, what can be done, and just go for it, you know, get help and do good things. What kind of boundaries did you have with your parents? The type of boundaries that I'm talking about are, for example, everything in flat face is my decision. If my parents think like, oh, what about this idea? They can give me an idea and then it's up to me to implement it. So even though they're working for me, they can't just be like, oh, we're going to change this or we're going to do this some other way or like we're going to try to save money here or cut corners there. Like none of that. It's all suggestions. And then I can ultimately decide like, oh, that sounds good or that doesn't sound good. And they've had a lot of really good ideas, too. But the thing is that if you own the company and you got it to a place that's really good already, you don't want to give up any kind of creative control to somebody else just because they don't have the exact like path that you took to get there, the same vision and stuff like that. So basically everything flat face is my decision 100%. Uh, what happens, who does what, how it happens, all that kind of stuff. And then I'm always welcome to suggestions, but it's all like ultimately I'm doing all like the most, the most important like decisions up at the top and then everything else is kind of like, all right, how can we all work together and make these things happen? What wheels? <laughs> it's an inside joke, so if you get it, you were there. For a while, every comment on YouTube videos, for some reason, people would just ask what wheels, and we'd get so annoyed because like, we tried so hard on a lot of these tricks or like whatever we're showing. It's like we put in so much effort just for somebody to ask what wheels we're using. <laughs> so it was just kind of like a funny joke. Like anytime that comment showed up, people would just be like, ah, oh, come on, dude. <laughs> but uh, what wheels? Flat face wheels. What's your favorite thing about holding store sesh for us to come and have fun for free? Having fun for free, that's perfect. I mean, opening the building with all the fingerboard parks and just having people come every month and fingerboard and there's so many people that have made friends there and, and a lot of people say like, you know, this is the highlight of my month every single month. So it's just like so much fun. So I love doing that and it's really cool fingerboarding with everybody, talking to new people from different places, seeing familiar faces. It's awesome. What fingerboard pet peeve do you hate? I don't hate anything, but um, if I had to choose something, I would say like rolling your kickflips off of the back tail. Like you should pop them properly and flick them properly, not just like the like roll kind of thing. Um, and then maybe like the overuse of keyframing videos, like where you have like a long lens angle and then it's like a super robotic movement because it's all keyframes, it's not like camera movement. Um, I would rather just see it a little zoomed out and just a static angle or filmed even better by a person. But yeah, like once in a while keyframing is really cool, but too much is too much. Yeah, this is a good one. How did you manage to keep your company alive after over a decade in the business? Yeah, um, business always seemed like common sense to me personally. Um, a combination of doing what you love and doing it in a way that doesn't lose money is like all you really need as a basis, you know? Um, as long as you're not selling things at a loss, you're taking into account 
how much you have to pay people and expenses and taxes and all these things that add up to like a whole lot of expenses, um, which you'll grow into gradually. So it's not all at once. You kind of get there slowly. As long as you keep track of stuff like that and keep things scaled properly, don't try to grow. Don't try to shrink. Just be where you are and make happen what you need to happen for the kind of requests that you have. Like if you have a lot of orders, be able to accommodate them, but don't just go make a thousand things that no one wants, you know? Grow slowly, it's okay if you have to slow down a little and stuff like that. Um, and just be conscious of like not doing anything at a loss for too long. Maybe if something happens at a loss, you have to correct that. You don't need to make a ton of money, but you just have to not lose money and then then you have a foundation of something solid. From there you can kind of see where it's going to go further. Do you have personal fingerboard skate park? I do, I have like 30. Who or what inspired you to start fingerboarding? So I started fingerboarding because I was skateboarding. I was like eight years old and it was super fun. I just started it. Um, and then kids in my school were fingerboarding. They had tech decks and they were flicking them around with three fingers and doing random stuff. And I thought it was super cool. So. Um, I asked my mom to get me a tech deck, and she did, and it's been super fun. Just ever since then, I've just been loving it. What is your favorite and most hated fingerboard trick? Um, my favorite is either a kickflip or a tray flip. They both feel really good. I can just do a million of them and just still have fun for some reason. I don't know. Just the feeling of flicking it and catching it and landing like a really clean one. I would say kickflip, actually, yeah. Kickflip. Most hated. I don't think people shouldn't even like use the word hate, really, because it's kind of like way too intense. But nolly heels are tough, you know? They're hard to do well. So there's a little bit of there's a little bit of tension between me and the nolly heels, you know? I can do them, but they're they're not that easy to do well and consistently into grind and stuff. So nolly heel for that. Does being a pro fingerboarder makes a big deal? And how much you being paid as a pro fingerboarder? Is it quite fine? It is quite fine, I'll tell you that. <laughs> is mayonnaise an instrument? <laughs> Hi Shane. What do I need to do to design a drawing for a pro model deck for you? Um, just draw it and I'm kind of picky, but if I like it, maybe I'll use it. When are we able to send in sponsor tapes or try out for flat face? Also, any USA competitions this year. I don't really sponsor people like from them sending in videos, but if you want to get sponsored by Flatface, you kind of have to just fingerboard, be really good, really maybe well known, or like do something cool, be a cool person, and over time I'll find you for sure. Like the Flatface team is kind of a family, so it's like if you get there, you get there. And a lot of teams are the same way. They'll find you. You don't really need to reach out to them. But if you're doing cool stuff, you're going to get sponsored for sure. Like, there's tons of people that are going to pick you out and be like, hey, you want to ride for my company? Like, I love what you're doing. So just do your best, you know? And don't do it for the sponsor. Do it for fun, and everything else will come. And any competitions this year? Uh, yeah, there's a cool fingerboard contest uh, by USA Fingerboard League. You can find them. Um, they're like going to all different locations and then uh, sometimes we do one at the rendezvous like a small contest and yeah there's probably more to look on I don't know Instagram I don't know how to find things on there but cool what made you choose the name Flatface and why were there any other names you had in mind if so what were those um yeah so the Flatface name is like super random uh, before that it was called Def FB. I wanted to put it in the newspaper, like a newspaper fingerboard ad, and my dad was like, you can't call it Def FB and put that in the newspaper. So I was like, cool, I'll just change it to Def. And this is like 2002, 2003. So I was like, Def FB. And then that didn't last too long either, and then I changed it, and I was just like saying random stuff or whatever, and it was just flat face. And I was like, all right, flat face, sure. So it doesn't really have any meaning. Like people ask, like, oh, it doesn't mean like you fell flat on your face or something like that, but. No, it's just totally random. Yeah, once Flatface got really big, like, I don't know, maybe 2007 or 8, I was like, dang, now I'm stuck with this really random name. Like, I can't change it now that I'm famous, you know? So, uh, but yeah, I like the name. Everybody loves it. It's just super random that it doesn't really mean anything, like, significant. But it's grown to mean, you know, Flatface is just what it is. BMX or a scooter? B 
BMX or a scooter? <laughs> <sighs> Skateboarding and fingerboarding. You don't need anything else. Um, I'm going to say skateboarding because I've scootered for a couple of years when I was small. I biked around a little bit, launched off some ramps, and skateboarding feels a million times better. I think there's more you can do creatively with skateboarding, but there's totally a lot you can do with scootering and BMXing too, but I just feel like for the long run, you're going to go back to skateboarding and just find that it's like so much more enjoyable. At least for me personally, everybody's different. So ultimately you got to do what you love, but just try not to like get in people's way. What decks besides your own brand are you riding in private? I mean, I don't do anything in private. I just fingerboard with anything, whatever. So uh, when I'm not using my own boards, I'm using boards mostly made by my friends. Uh, Snake House, Cow Ply, Berlin Wood, Black River, um, Flint, Duck Decks is a new one. They're really cool, clear ones. Um, yeah, just, there's a whole bunch really. Like, anything that I use you'll see in my videos over time, like, go through them all. I'm usually using my own boards, but I love using other boards too. What would you say the peak year of fingerboarding was? That's cool. Um, I think 2020 was like Christmas all year long because everybody was stuck at home and a lot of people came back into fingerboarding. Uh, it kind of grew a lot during 2020 just because everybody was doing that. So, yeah, 2020 was a great year. And then I think 2009 was revolutionary. I think 2009, 2010, everybody that was there for it would agree. Like those were some of the best years ever by far. And I think um, a lot of that is owed to Black River. I mean, they came out with the Black River trucks at that point. We were all using Tech Deck trucks before that. So if you can imagine those dinky little 26 millimeter trucks and you're just stuck with those and they break and don't turn well and don't perform that good and all that. So that kind of like kicked things into a new gear and they brought a whole bunch of people to the US for a tour and there was so many good videos coming out at that time. Um, new cameras, like we were getting DVXs and it was just like, things were kind of going from like super amateur to like really professional, really fast. There was just a ton of like good influence and growth during that time too. Cool. This is also a good one. Hey Mike, I've been watching your YouTube since I was 10 years old and my question to you is, how do you stay motivated all this time? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think about it really. I love fingerboarding a lot. Um, anytime that there's like a new obstacle to use or a new spot or I'm going somewhere and there's different things to use, it's like really fun. Um, so I guess if you're getting bored, just like make or buy a new obstacle or even just travel somewhere for a few days and like see what you can find um, anywhere. But I think just doing what you love kind of keeps the interest going, you know? And then fingerboarding with people, like I said before, really makes it exciting or participating in like an online contest if you have nobody around you or even just filming a really good fingerboard video part. Like if you're all by yourself and you got no one to fingerboard with, just be like, I'm going to film my best stuff, I'm going to save the clips for however many months it takes and put my favorite song at the moment to it and just like, you know, put together something you're really proud of or learn to make something, try to make like the best park you can make or whatever. There's just so many different things you can do that keep it really, really fun. So I think like, because fingerboarding has so many dimensions to it, you can't really get bored. Like. Maybe for two years you don't want to make any ramps, but you're more interested in like learning new tricks or like sometime you're like, eh, I'm kind of bored of like fingerboarding, but maybe if I make a new obstacle, I'll have fun. Then you make like some cool stuff. So there's just, there's always things you can do to keep it interesting for sure. Oh, and watch skateboarding videos too. That helps a lot. Um, I can watch like a single skate part of like anyone good and just be like, all right, I got to go fingerboard now. Kind of like do those tricks or do something inspired by those tricks or make an obstacle similar to something you saw, stuff like that. Worst or craziest customer experience? So there was one kid who tried to scam us and basically uh, I think we called, tried to call his parents and talk to them and he told them like that we were trying to scam him 
And so the parents believed the kid, of course. So the parents brought the kid to the police station and told them what the kid told them. And the police were like, all right, cool. We just need to see some evidence. Evidence? There's supposed to be evidence? And so they took a look at the correspondence and then they called us and they asked us about it. And they found out that the kid was scamming us. And it was so bad to the point where basically the kid was like facing a possibility of going to jail for half a year. And it's all because he tried to scam us. And then he lied to get away with it. And his parents literally brought him to the police and basically turned him in by accident because they didn't check into what was true and what wasn't. So, yeah, I felt bad, you know, like I wasn't trying to get him in trouble or anything like that. I just had to defend the fact that I was getting scammed by somebody. So I just showed them the correspondence and what happened. So, yeah, uh, hopefully he's fine. I hope he didn't get in trouble, but I don't know. I think he might have. Moral of the story, don't scam companies. Um, some police take credit card fraud extremely seriously. So even if you just take your parents' card without them knowing, you can get in trouble. So please don't do that. You know, if you're gonna buy things, make sure like it's your money or you have permission. It was crazy and we get other crazy ones, but that one really stands out. Do you feel as if the community on Instagram has changed? If so, how? I don't know how Instagram really works in terms of the fingerboard community. I know that there's a lot going on and I have no idea how to find it. Usually people show me cool things that I never saw before and I'm just like, yeah, I didn't see that because I don't know how to use Instagram. So uh, post more things on YouTube, that'd be cool. Favorite spot you have made? Probably Tony Hawk's parking lot. It's just such a fun park. Um, it's like some of my best work for sure. Um, yeah, I'd go with that one. What do you value the most when starting a company? Why are you doing it? You know, you gotta bring something to the table. Basically, there's gotta be something you like and you see like, oh, this could be done better and then do it. I think that's the best way. That's how like every good company pretty much started. Like somebody trying to improve something that they already love, just do it even better. High kicks or low kicks? Whatever this is, medium, I guess. My boards are kind of in the middle. They're not super low. I don't like really flat boards, but I don't like super steep. Although I can use super steep boards. They're actually like pretty fun. It's easier to use sometimes. So that's why mine are kind of in the middle. Hey, hey, Maverick. What advice do you have for someone that wants to grow up to be a business owner? So I started flat face because I basically wanted to make better fingerboards. And I think a lot of the great companies in the world, no matter what they're for, they're kind of like somebody wanted to improve something, make something better, make something new. So I think just having a good purpose, you know, don't start a business in anything because you want money. Start a business because you want to do whatever that business does and you want to do it well. And that will set you up for success. What's the feeling of finding a gifted fingerboard spot? Yeah, it's really exciting for sure. When you find something to fingerboard on that's not for fingerboarding, like that keeps it super interesting. It happens all the time, especially if you go out to like a city or something, or even just like in a store or a restaurant or wherever, there's always cool things to fingerboard on. So it's just kind of like, it's the same as skateboarding. Like you see the world differently than everyone else. Everywhere you look, you see spots where somebody else might see like, oh, it's just boring old stairs. And you're like, that's a perfect five set. Look at that. I want to skate that, you know? And fingerboarding is the same way. It's like, you see, like, somebody might just be like, yeah, I just have these stupid two counters. And you're like, dude, you have two counters. There's a gap in a ledge, and it's so awesome. Like, it, it's really, it makes things so exciting in a unique way. So, yeah, it's awesome. Will you make any throwback wheels? It would be cool to see Purple Yetis again. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing things back from time to time. It just depends. Some things got discontinued for different reasons. So, like, those were a very soft material that would kind of break. So I'm trying to stick to things that don't break so people are like satisfied in the long run. Um, but yeah, there's there's a few things coming back. What happened to MKS? He was a legend. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. I haven't heard from him in a long time, but he was a cool fingerboarder from like Alaska. He was shredding way back in the day. Uh, yeah, if you're watching this, make a new fingerboard video. That'd be sweet. Do you ever get hand or finger fatigue? Uh, my fingers have crazy muscles, so not really, but Sometimes different parts of your arm, if you're trying the same trick for like 
a long time, like 20, 30 minutes or something, sometimes like you'll get a little bit sore, like if it's an awkward trick or a weird reach or like anything nolly heel, I feel like it gets like somewhere up here, like strange, I don't know. But in general, not really. Nolly help lesson. Um, do it off of something small, like a little book or a little ledge or something. Um, so you can kind of like do basically a nose manual, like jump off something and then yeah, just practice really. Everything is practice. Um, nolly and switch is like relearning. So you can ollie, then you have to learn it all over again when you go switch and nolly. It's just like the same motions but opposite fingers. So just learning it all over again from scratch. So really just practice, um, you know, having that momentum, moving with it. And it's harder to nollie over something compared to off of something. So start by doing it off of something. You can go from nose manual, then pop it a little, and gradually get more control of it that way. Do you think the fingerboard hate has gotten better over the years? Yeah, for sure. I think people are more accepting of things that they don't know things about these days compared to like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Um, it's never really been that bad or anything, but I think yeah, nowadays like fingerboarding is more accepted than it's been ever before and more people are interested in it than before. And I think that has to do a lot with skateboarding too. Because skateboarding, like, we were really rebels for skateboarding. We were like the kids that were weird and different and goofy and like our parents were probably slightly concerned at some point, like what is my kid doing? Why isn't he like doing real sports or something? And now like skateboarding is in the Olympics and it's everywhere. and people who don't skateboard have more respect for skateboarding than they have ever in the past, which is probably like a net positive for everybody, I think. Um, you know, a lot of people who want to skateboard now can just do it without getting so much backlash. And so fingerboarding is the same way. It's like, oh cool, you're just playing with like a little skateboard, just having fun, you know? And it's not just like, what is that? That's weird. It's, it's just cool. What's the most unique project you've worked on? The fingerboard event at the Museum of Science because it's just so random. I don't know, just things like that. Like, fingerboarding has taken me to random different places that you wouldn't really imagine. There's a little bit of footage and stuff, but nothing that like made sense for what happened, so it's just kind of gone. <laughs> Jay probably remembers better than me. Yeah, Jay remembers everything. This is a great one. What is your favorite part of making decks? When you're making a board, and you just kind of hit that point where it's almost done, and you're just like, this is a good one, and you just feel it. Um, everything came together perfectly when you were sanding and rounding it and like, you know, as you sand the width of it and you see the shape really defined on the edge and it's super crisp and just everything feels right, you just know, like when, when you made a good board compared, to, like all boards are pretty good once you're, when you know what you're doing, but when you make that one that's just like, oh my god, this is the one, this is like one of the best boards I've made in a long time, when that happens, that's my favorite, for sure. Dream collab. Tony Hawk. Let's do something cool. What inspires you to fingerboard? Fingerboarding. I don't know. It's just built in at this point. Everything. Skateboarding especially. But really anything and everything. Like You just have to see a spot and you'll envision a trick and you just gotta go for it. Like when I go to U Burger, there's this really nice ledge there and I always fingerboard on it every time. I don't care who's there. How busy it is, who's watching, I'm doing it. Oh, this is a cool one. What was your answer to, what do you want to do when you grow up as a child? So I always wanted to be a doctor from when I was really little. I was like saying that when I was, I don't know, three or something, like I want to be a doctor. And up until when I was 16 or 17, and then I started thinking like, you know, there's a lot to it that I don't think I want to deal with. It's just kind of like stressful, like there's people that are built for that, but I think I have like too much empathy, so I think it would be kind of difficult. And then I saw like, I don't know, things that are kind of like wrong with our medical industry in a way, so I was just like, you know what, I don't think being a doctor is right for me, like there's better people for it. And then so it was like, uh oh, what am I going to do, you know, when you had your whole life set, like, you know, I'm going to do this, and then all of a sudden you're like, I don't think I want to do that anymore. And then I kind of realized, like, you know, flat face is doing pretty well. What if I was super crazy, just didn't go to college, and just do fingerboarding? Just keep going with flat face and see where it goes. And my dad thought it was a great idea. 
my mom was a little skeptical because we all thought for sure I was going to go to college, but we decided to go for it and it worked out. So if you have something good going for you, you definitely don't have to like follow a mainstream path. Just follow what works and what you love. Does it needs Nolly and Switch stance to become a pro? Um, I mean, not necessarily, but it would help. I'm sure if you were really good, no one would even notice if you didn't do Nolly and Switch, really. Like, sometimes I film and don't do any Nolly or Switch, or sometimes I might do only Switch. Like, I don't know. It just depends. Like, the more you can do, the better, because I guess if you can't do Nolly, like, you're limited on a lot of regular tricks, too, because once you get into nose grinds, like, what are you going to do? You can't Nolly flip out or something, so... I don't know, I would suggest learning and practicing it over time, but nothing's a necessity, you know, just have fun with it really. If you lost the ability to fingerboard, what would you supplement all that time with? Skateboarding, reading, filming, editing, not really that much editing, but maybe get back into photography. I like learning, you know, just learning all kinds of stuff about anything, so probably a ton of reading, stuff like that. I'd probably become a farmer, actually. You know, it would be cool to be like a self-sufficient farmer, growing all your own food, raising some animals, being outside a lot, stuff like that. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff you can do on planet Earth. How often do you get a new setup? Pretty often, but I always go back to my favorite few. So unless I set one up that's like as good or better than my best one, it's kind of like I'll use other boards here and there because they all have different feelings and some might be better for like certain tricks or certain vibes or whatever. But um, this board I've had since like 2014 set up just like this and I have a few other boards that are even older that I've just been using for so long so yeah I get a lot of new setups all the time people always give me new boards to try out and people are making amazing things so I have like tons of setups but as to like what I use most of the time is like a pretty old really good board that like I know how it feels and stuff like when you get used to a board like this that you've had for so many years like no matter how you land on it if you land wrong like you're still set up for the next trick anyways because you know how to use the board from like a not ideal position because you know how it's going to respond to like every little thing so getting to know one setup for a long time is the key to happiness for sure now it's the key for like learning how to be like really consistent and really tech i think it helps a ton are flat face bike racks ever making a comeback? Yeah, I hope so. Um, they're very difficult to make, very expensive, so I didn't want to bring them back at a crazy price point. Like, I'd rather not sell them for $80 or something, so just waiting till the right opportunity comes where I can produce them at like a reasonable cost again. We do have a square one still from Black River, so I kind of like let them make the square version of it. So we have those on the website. Is there any trick you can't do or never did before? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but there's infinite tricks, so there's pretty much infinite tricks that I've never done before. Would you ever skate with shoes on your fingers? So if I'm skateboarding, like on a real skateboard, and I have shoes on my fingers, that's totally fine. Have you ever snapped a fingerboard on a trick? Nope. Yeah, favorite tech deck that you had growing up? Um, so my first tech deck is my favorite, just because like that started everything and I still have it on my wall, so. Will the tea material come back, maybe as a special edition? Yes. The tea material is coming back. I got a special limited run of, you'll see. What is the most important thing at fingerboarding? The most important thing, I don't know, have fun. That's all that really matters, it's all for fun, you know? <laughs> Fave video, Pissing Fingers 2 by Black River. I'm pretty sure the whole thing is on YouTube, we used to have to get it as a DVD, so find that, watch it, watch it again, watch it a week from now, watch it a month from now. I used to watch that thing all the time, that inspired everything I do pretty much, like to a huge degree anyways. That was around 2003-ish that that came out, maybe 2004, and yeah, that's like all the dudes in Germany like shredding, doing events. There's like this businessman looking guy does a kickflip to fakie on a quarter pipe like at some event and it's just so mind blowing. The whole video is great. Uh, Timo, Nick, Elias. I learned how to tray flip from Nick Herzog doing like tray flip to fakie, like super exaggerated like vertical one. And I was like, that's so cool. I love that style. So if you ever see me do like a really vertical tray flip, 
I'm probably like super nostalgic in that moment, just like remembering that clip that I learned how to tray flip from watching. Um, so yeah, definitely Pissing Fingers 2 for sure. Watch that video immediately. What motivates you to keep doing flat face? Have you ever thought about creating a new entity for different fingerboard products? No, there's no reason to. Why would you? Like flat face is everything that I made it, so I wouldn't really want to like split it off into something else. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, but what motivates me to keep doing it is just, it's just what I do. It's so fun, and I'm always trying to see, like, you know, how can we improve or keep going with this, or what what can be done next, and what can we keep doing that's doing well, and that's about it. It's just, like, so many people are having a ton of fun fingerboarding because of all the stuff that comes out of flat face, and yeah, it's it's just awesome. Make sure you breathe. This is a long question. See if I can do it. Do you think fingerboarding would be as big as it is now without the outreach Instagram gave the scene to the younger upcoming generation? And do you think Instagram clips are older value against time like some of the older and now considered nostalgic videos from early on 2000s YouTube era of fingerboarding? Use punctuation. I have no oxygen left in my brain. I can't process the question. Oh, Rob, a busy little pancake. Yeah, it's a pancake with an arm over the edge. I think fingerboarding would be as big as it is now without Instagram or close, um, just because it was already getting really big before Instagram came in. Like, everything was on YouTube, so, like, you know, there's YouTube videos with millions of views, there's tons of people. I meet people on the street that are like, I got into fingerboarding from your YouTube videos, and like, I'm still surprised that they recognize me, and then I have to process that, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's really cool, you know? So. Instagram is definitely where it's all going down now, or like a lot of it, but I don't think it's necessary, it's more of just where it is, where it went, um, but fingerboarding is everywhere, so it's in real life, it's at skate parks, it's on YouTube, it's on Instagram, um, everywhere else, you know, so yeah, it's, it's a big part of it. I don't think Instagram clips can really hold the same weight that like a good YouTube video holds, because you can't just kind of like find it later. You can't be like, hey, remember that video from a few years ago that this person put on Instagram? Let's go type it in and find it. And it's not that easy to find. And I don't know, it's small. It's on your little screen. It's not like on your computer or you can like stream it to your TV or something from YouTube. That's like way cooler to watch it big and have your speakers and like gather around and enjoy it versus like a quick thing on Instagram that kind of grabs your attention and then loses it just as quickly, you know, you're like, wow, that was so good, and then you scroll and it's immediately something else, and it's like rapid fire, it's like you can't focus your attention span on things as well when you're like using Instagram, so yeah, there, there's a lot of cool stuff on there, but I think uh, for like standing the test of time, like real videos on YouTube are like where it's at. Cool. How many parts do you have? Like, at least 30. At least 40! How long does it take you to make a board? Oh, maybe like 20 or 30 minutes. At least 40! Of like, working on it, and then a lot more time, you know, hours and hours in the mold, hours and hours drying, sanding it again, so... The whole process, like, you know, five, six hours, you could crank out a board from start to finish, including like, the wait time. Have you ever been criticized or made fun of for fingerboarding? Uh... I don't know, if I have I kind of forgot because I don't really care, but probably at some point. Uh, like not everybody knows what fingerboarding is or like gets it, so probably when I was younger a little bit, but most people at my school thought it was really neat because they were like, holy crap, he has a company and stuff, so I don't know, like I guess I'm kind of biased, but I got treated like pretty well overall. I always see you with the fresh EG15 all natural plies, rosewood or two-tone. Yep, two-tone's the best. Um, it performs better, even better than maple, in my opinion. It's just the best wood ever, so. What was your hardest battle? How many hours did it take? My first kickflip nose slide ever was, I was sitting at my desk, and I was filming, and it took over an hour. It was kickflip, frontside nose slide, and I finally got it, and then I realized the camera had died who knows how long ago. Like, I didn't even get it on film but it was just so satisfying to see like, wow, I can really do that. Like, that was a very hard trick for me at the time. Now I can do it probably almost every try, but back then it was a big deal. So that was super cool. Um, 
And then there's been other tricks where I've spent like at least half an hour on them, but not very common. Like usually if I don't get something in like two or three minutes, maybe five minutes, I'll try something else and I'll go back to that trick later. Cause trying the same trick for too long just kind of gets stale and sometimes it's like more detrimental, like you're not getting that much progress anymore. So take a break from it and go back to it. Will you fingerboard forever? Absolutely. Fingerboard and skateboard as long as possible. I've said it before, I expect to be, you know, at least 80 years old, like skateboarding, just cruising down the street, like, it's gonna happen for sure. As long as it's possible, I'll be doing it, because it's what I love to do. When's the next store sesh? I don't know yet, but check the website, uh, flatfacefingerboards.com. I always post info about the events on there. What do you think about the bigger board trends? Will 26 millimeter ever make a comeback? So. Yeah, once in a while I make 28 millimeters, 26, 30, 32, all different sizes, but for the most part, uh, personally I just make what I want to use, so 33.6 is the way. Um, I do think it's kind of crazy that we keep getting wider and wider, because, yeah, we used to always use 26s back in the day, but I think at least like 32 feels a lot better than 26, just like you have a lot more control, it's easier to land stuff clean and do harder tricks and stuff like that. So I think anywhere from 32 to 34 is like the sweet spot. I don't think we should really keep going past that. Um, it's fine if you do, but I don't think like the trend's gonna go forever because then we'll be using circles. How much time do you fingerboard each day? Um, it varies a ton. If I'm with people, I'll probably fingerboard with them for a long time. If I'm by myself, it varies from 30 seconds to an hour, you know, just depends. If I sit down and fingerboard and film by myself, it could be an hour or two. Or if I'm just fingerboarding for fun, it's probably gonna be 15, 20 minutes at a time, or five minutes here and there, two minutes, walking by something and see it real quick. It just varies. Somebody said, where is fingerboarding? And somebody else replied, when is fingerboarding? Uh, how is fingerboarding? Has fingerboarding peaked as a hobby or do you think we're still in the early days? No, we're just evolving. We're in the middle, you know, like we're way past the early days as I described before, but things are constantly evolving and improving. So we're, we're going, you know, it's, it's continuing for sure. How do you hone your FB skills? Fingerboard, that's it. Watch skateboarding too. I think that helps a lot. They go hand in hand, so you can learn from either one how to do the other. And watching skateboarding, for sure, you really see like the motions better on like how to varial heel or something like you just see what they're doing and then you figure out you know where the fingers have to go where the best position is and go from there so yeah just keep doing it have fun with it watch videos and watch slow-mo too i think slow-mo helps a lot what's it like when black river wants to send you a custom park what goes into that do they surprise you or do you get a say in how it is built it's super exciting when black river wants to send me a new park i'll tell you that uh, it's like, I know that that means there's a couple years of excitement coming up, like you get a new park and you use it for a long time and it's so fun and everybody comes and visits they're like, oh, I want to use the new park and it's just super cool. Um, what goes into it, it's usually they design something awesome and they show me it and I'm blown away and I'm like, yeah. So <laughs> that's about it really. Sometimes I'll like throw a few ideas their way, but usually Martin designs the parks and just makes them and it's awesome. How do you feel about the fingerboard community in 2022? It's awesome. It's growing. We have a lot of people that came back in. We have a lot of new people all the time. I think it's as big as ever, or as bigger than ever, really. It's, it's really good. There's tons of events, and it's super fun. What's your favorite and least favorite thing about the current fingerboard scene? So, favorite thing about the scene is all the friendships that come from fingerboarding. You know, everybody's meeting some of their best friends through fingerboarding online, through events. Um, it's just amazing like how many people come together. Fingerboarders all have similar kind of personalities to an extent. Like we're all doing this thing that's not like super mainstream and it's more creative and stuff like that. So it brings together a lot of cool people. And then uh, least favorite thing about the current scene I would say is like we need more people putting in effort to make YouTube videos again. Um, like everything's on Instagram and then it just goes away and you can't search and see it that easy. So I think people should put their uploads. You can upload on both, you know, you can put the same video on Instagram and on YouTube 
and then at least when you want to see it later it's on YouTube and if you get a lot of views now on Instagram that's awesome so maybe do both you know this is a cool one how long do you try new stuff on your board before you decide if it fits your style or not um yeah a few minutes really because I've been fingerboarding for so long that I pretty much know what works or what doesn't if I try something and it works better I know it immediately if it works worse I also know it immediately and then I'll you know try to get used to it and adapt to it and see if there's a reason to do it and usually it's not good so um, at this point I'm kind of stuck in my ways just because I know what like this setup works ten times better for me than like something that I don't like so there's no point in trying to force using like a board just because it looks good if it doesn't perform good or something like that so yeah um, but I think thinking back I would probably give a setup like five days or something you know like really use it for a while before I determine like oh this is bad I want to change it up or this is good or whatever but yeah nowadays it's like very quick I know for sure like really easily because I can get used to a setup in like 10 tricks or something you know you do the basics and you like know how it works at least to an extent what are the must do's needing and filming a video what tips do you have for getting the best looking fingerboard footage things to do and avoid manual settings on your camera is huge and I think with iPhone you can do it as well um, and then getting good lighting is really important too so a combination of those will really help you a lot and then just making sure everything's in frame and putting a little bit of thought into the angle goes a long way so if you're doing a certain trick where one angle like might be blocked by part of your hand or your arm or something like that you might want to think like where can I move the camera that would look better for this and if you're struggling with that maybe like look at some skateboarding videos notice like you know back tails are almost always filmed from a certain angle that you can see it you know you wouldn't film it from somewhere or like you know if you're like this you wouldn't want to film it where your hands covering it like you'd want to film it from here or from here so just make sure you can see what you're doing and bright light manual focus uh, shutter speed aperture stuff like that white balance and then you'll have a really good looking video even with a relatively low budget camera or an iPhone or anything there's apps you can get that help you customize your settings and you can do a really good job then. How do you respond to people thinking that fingerboarding isn't that serious? You know, like I'll explain it to them and a lot of people get it and a lot of people don't and then some people are like in the middle but at this point it doesn't really matter that much. It's more of like, you know, this is my hobby. I don't need to understand why somebody else likes doing some kind of hobby that I don't understand. Like it would be cool to look at it and stuff but if at the end of the day I didn't understand it I'd just be like, okay, go have fun with it, you know? that's that's all there is to it really so as long as people are cool with it then it's not a big deal and even if they're not it's like you know do you really care that much they probably don't what motivates you the most besides your business to still fingerboard after such a long time my business does not motivate me my business exists because I fingerboard so it's kind of the other way around you know um, I love fingerboarding and just doing it and so the business is like a natural side project of that. It's like, it's just me doing what I love, you know? That's about it. Um, so really what motivates me is just that I like fingerboarding. It's super fun. You can do it anywhere. You can always learn new tricks. You can always do the same tricks better and better. And then there's so many things that come along with it. There's videos, there's meeting people, going places. Like, I've traveled the world because of it. Like, there's it's amazing just super fun yeah same question would you still be fingerboarding without owning flat face for sure help me with nollie heels you help me with nollie heels i don't know what can you recommend to help do flip tricks into grinds do the grind do the flip trick separately you know if you want to do kickflip nose grind do some kickflips on flat do some nose grinds and then go for it and then another thing is like if you feel like you messed up as you're flipping it Put your finger where it needs to land anyways, where the nose grind would be, because sometimes it'll just make it happen. So, like, always land in the position that you're aiming for, even if you don't think it's going to be the try that you make it, because a lot of times it will be, or it'll lead you to get closer to it. Do you think that skateboarding and fingerboarding are connected, or are they completely different? They're completely the same. Um, you can learn back and forth. You can learn something on one from the other in either direction. All the time it happens. 
Favorite fingerboard related trip? Germany. I've been there a lot of times. It's hard to pick a favorite. Maybe my first one, because I feel like that kind of started a lot of things. You know, my first time going to Germany was mind blowing. So that's the one. This one just says if you could go back in time, is there anything you'd do differently? I've been watching since 2007 and it's been a blast. Thank you for all the go for being the go-to for US fingerboarding all these years. Yeah, so that's really cool. Um, I would not change anything in my life and yeah, I mean everything happens for a reason. Every single mistake that you make like teaches you a lesson and helps you to do whatever it is, do it better next time. So I can't say there's anything in my whole entire life or in my business that I would change if I could like use a time machine or something because then we would not be where we are right now. <laughs> Will you sign me? Yeah. Has fingerboarding so much caused any type of injury? Nope. What's the worst wood veneer you can use to make decks? Balsa wood. I don't even know what it exists for. It's so light and soft you could like break it with your pinky. I'm sure in your years and years of fingerboarding you have seen many things change in the scene. What are some of your favorite things you've seen change for the better? Pretty much all of it. Everything's been improving. Um, I think it's really cool that there's places you can go to fingerboard in real life now because it used to be just like you and maybe your friends at one of your houses or something and now there's different locations, there's shops, there's parks, there's all kinds of stuff like the community has grown a ton and it's just more and more fun as we get more experiences that we can go have and that anyone can join in, you know? Do you feel like you have stronger fingers than the average person? If so, has this helped you with other things in life? Yeah, maybe. It could. I think your fingers are pretty strong. Yeah. You look strong when you do things. <laughs> I have noticed this. Yeah. Since the beginning. Wow, since the beginning? Yeah. Alright, then it's real. The lady says yes. <laughs> what is the most significant and memorable board to you? Henry, my first two-tone Berlinwood. I have it set up and it's in a safe right now. That thing was a game changer. That was the first, probably the first board that I used like for so many years in a row when I didn't know like I would end up using setups for a super long time if they were that much better than like the next best amazing board. So yeah, that one's legendary. How do you feel about people coring their flat face dual duros? So yeah, when people modify the wheel by taking off the outside part, um, I think it's pretty cool, you know, because fingerboarding is all about modifying everything around you and building and creating, so it's pretty natural that if you leave an opportunity for it, it's going to happen. So, yeah, like I don't personally like using small wheels, but I think it's, it's really funny and it's cool to see that people get like such a blast out of doing that. Things used to be really DIY back in the day, like even when Black River Trucks first came out, like there was no wheels that worked on them, so you'd have to like super glue the nut and there was no lock nuts like there's been so much progression from the beginning and we're all used to like modifying everything so now everything works really easily and we don't even have to think about it but yeah it's definitely in our nature as fingerboarders to like just do everything you know be fixing things and making things modifying things all right how would an average joe make money off of fingerboarding if you want to make money off of it then you should have something really special to contribute, you know? If you can do something better than somebody else has done, or different, or unique, uh, that's where you're gonna do a good job and people are gonna want whatever it is that you have. Um, other than that, like, if you're some business person trying to cash in, it's been tried a million times, it never works, because it's kind of like, you gotta love what you're doing, especially in such a small space. Like, everybody knows everyone and who they are and what they're doing, so. Yeah, have something special to offer and you know, you'll get rewarded for sure. What would you be doing right now if you didn't start flat face? And do you think you'd be just as successful doing that? Um, I think I would be, I don't know what it is, but yeah, like, like I said before, business feels supernatural to me. So I think if you just do what you love and you know how to do it in a way that you can spread it to other people and stuff like that, why not, you know? So yeah. I'd probably be doing some other kind of business or something. Mm -hmm. She's purring so hard. I know, she looks like she's in heaven. What are ways to stay motivated and keep consistent on making content? 
Um, I'm always motivated to make new videos because there's just so much around me that I see and that I envision that I haven't even done yet. And like I have different cameras and different lenses and different looks that I'm going for with the videos. And then depending who's visiting, different friends, like all these ideas come together and it's like, all right, like a certain person comes over and it's like, let's make a video, you know, with the VX1000 and kind of have it look washed out and on some older crunchy looking obstacles and get real crisp audio and then somebody else comes and is like alright you love HD let's go for like the most cinematic video we can make and use this new thing that one of us made or whatever like there's just endless things so if you stay around creative people and doing creative stuff yourself and just see like what different ways can I look at this and which ways can I portray it and stuff like that you'll never get bored you know there's a lot of motivation there just like how can i make my next video a little bit better than the last one or you know just kind of keep upping the quality and the the tricks and everything how does one organize a meetup to make friends or make collabs or shred with people so yeah um i made the first fingerboard event in like 2007 and there were no events like in the country and I was basically just on the tech deck forums connecting with different fingerboarders and inviting some people and like most people couldn't come and then one person came but he brought three friends and then I had my four friends or so so then it was like you know like eight of us or something and then that was a nice event you know and then from there like people saw that one we posted a video and then they were like wow that's a real thing there's a fingerboard event I want to go I can't believe I missed that and the next one was like 20 or 30 people the next one is 40, 50-ish, and then now we have 400 plus at every single event. So that was just me in my driveway who started it, and it was literally one group of friends that drove here from New Jersey to meet my group of friends from here, and that's all it took. So if you have a friend online or something, you know, obviously they're a real person and they're cool and stuff, uh, you know, you could do a little event with them or like a few people or reach out see who's in your area, put up a flyer, go to the skate park maybe, and just, it doesn't have to be super serious with a contest or anything, like just put together a table or two and just fingerboard. What was it like working with Bones on the collab? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, he just kind of reached out to me and was like, hey, you wanna do a collab? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then he sent me the graphic and we made it and we just went for it and I sent him some boards and then I released them with no, warning to anyone like no one knew it was even coming and they sold out in like I don't know minutes or an hour or something like that like really fast and yeah it was really cool um some people might know he's a fingerboarder he has been for a long time like since the early FFI days so yeah it's like really cool to collaborate with him when making a video what do you do first music or get the clips uh 99 of the time get the clips first and then try to find a song that fits once in a while, I'll be listening to music and kind of envision like a fingerboard video to it. Um, but yeah, it just depends. Usually, uh, I'm filming a lot more fingerboarding than how many songs I even know about. So then I gotta find music after. That's why some of the songs are like totally ridiculous random. It's just fun. All right, favorite snack is a macro bar lately. Those are really good. It's like a protein bar. It's good stuff. <laughs> Why do you need the macro bar? The macro bar saves me because I have to eat constantly and if I don't eat constantly I have only a short amount of time until I need to eat and the macro bar saves me because you don't have to make it, you don't have to prepare it, it's just ready, you open it up and you eat it and then you feel good again. So the macro bar for sure. Not sponsored <laughs> at all but if you guys want to sponsor me I'll take more macro bars and I will eat them. And people will know about it. <laughs> hundred years. Have you ever ridden your fingerboard over the curves of a naked supermodel? Don't you think it's time? The footage exists, but you guys probably won't see it. There you go, that little hidden gem. Do you still have your original Bondo molds? When was the last time you pressed a deck in a mold that you made a long time ago? Yeah, I still have some, uh, I think I have the G4 mold, it's like so tiny though, it's like, the mold itself is like 26 millimeters, because that's how big boards were back then. So, 
you know, that's an awesome idea. Though. I should actually press another board in there and make it. That would be really fun. It's been a little while for sure. Can you give a little insight on finger angles, run-ups, and different popping techniques? Like for example, when you do a fakey backside flip, it's much easier if you do it perpendicular to your body. The more you fingerboard, the better you get at doing tricks from weird angles and stuff like that, which is really fun. So like if something's in your way and you're like tall, like how you, how it's, like you wouldn't normally, like, and then you can still do a trick, it's all in just practice. And that's somewhere where it really helps to have like at least medium to steep nose and tail like then you can pop from awkward angles a lot easier and like do really subtle motions with your fingers to get the flip going how you want it and stuff like that so yeah just having a setup that you're very used to that you've used for a long time and then that's not like too mellow helps a lot do you miss your generation such as andrew king doug bodkin maddie taylor taylor rosenbauer chris daniels ethan ebeling tim hurley Tim Putz, Harold Schoen, and many more. What is the difference with the current scene? Thanks. A lot of those guys I'm still in touch with, like at least half of them still fingerboard. I was just fingerboarding with Doug yesterday and Harry's coming to visit next month. And then, yeah, Tim Hurley, he was at the rendezvous. Um, Rosenbauer I'm seeing at the end of this month. So yeah, like a lot of them are still around, but just not like as into the fingerboarding scene as they used to be. But yeah, I mean, I miss all the people that kind of like disappeared or got, you know, into other things over time, but there's also a lot of new people and there's a lot of people in the scene now that have been around since the beginning too. Some of them are like not as well known publicly, but a ton of us have been fingerboarding for like a really long time and like a lot of people came back recently too. So yeah, it's really cool. Favorite food to eat while fingerboarding? Uh, probably the sandwich. People always ask me where my sandwich is if I don't have one, which implies like I probably usually do. Anytime I show up to like an event or something, like I'm pretty much eating a sandwich in one hand and fingerboarding with the other. So definitely a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, one time I went to Germany and I had not been there in, you know, a year or two years or whatever. And I walked into the Berlin store and the first thing that anyone said to me was, Mike, where's your sandwich? <laughs> And so that's when I realized, like, wow, I'm really eating all the time, huh? Like, that's, that's the impression, you know, that I leave. It's like, yeah, he's always eating. Parents have commented on it before, like, oh, yeah, he's always eating. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. How many whoops do you own? I have one of the first ones ever. Um, and I have, yeah, I don't know. I probably have, like, at least 40. Five, at least, maybe more. I have some really cool ones. Favorite sauce on eggs? Wow. Yeah, jalapeno hot sauce. Oh, hot sauce. Yeah, hot sauce with jalapeno, like a really mild, but like flavorful. Yeah. Best and worst interaction with someone in the community. Best, like almost all of them. I've made some of my best friends through fingerboarding. So there's that. Um, there's a lot of really cool people. Worst, uh, maybe like way back in the day when I was still kind of getting established with flat face and like some people were competitive, but yeah, the, uh, there was one dude like spreading rumors saying that like my boards were made in China and all this other stuff that was not true because I was hand making all the boards by myself at home. And then he was going around telling people they're made in China and don't support them. They're made mass production and blah, blah, blah. And he knew it wasn't true. And most people knew it wasn't true, but it was just like, there's people that have done stuff like that. So yeah. And also, do you own a VX-1000? I do, I finally got a VX-1000 just a couple of years ago, and I fell in love with it. I'm like, I can't believe I never had this thing before. This is like so good. Um, it's, it's really a game changer, and you appreciate it a whole lot. How did you become successful in selling fingerboards? Making the best boards that I could and telling people about it. That was about it, like pretty basic. It just kind of happened. I didn't really expect it, and then I just kind of went with it. Set up recommendation for an already experienced fingerboarder. <laughs> Flatface G15, Black River Trucks, Flatface Wheels G4 or G8. How do you get inspiration for your fingerboard parks? That's cool. It's always a lot of fun. Um, I'll usually start with ideas for like a spot or two and try to like plop it down somewhere and then think what would flow nicely into this or what might it connect to or you know how can we 
put together a few different spots that I've thought of in a cool way and then just kind of brainstorm from there. You can lay it out in person with like blocks of wood or things to kind of represent what you're playing with and move it around and or you can do it on SketchUp or draw it on paper and then think on it for a while and show some friends, get some feedback and ideas and just like try to make the best thing with like the most functionality, like the most different ways you can use each thing will make for a park that lasts a long time in terms of not getting boring and then just pick out some cool materials and make it as good as you can. Will flat face ever make old school shapes? I made like the face shavers for a while so maybe sometime I'll make some more of those. Those are pretty cool. So yeah, um, it'll be limited but for sure. Will you ever make it possible to choose a color for your decks? It's been possible the whole time. You just have to write it in your order comments and 95% of the time we have it in the color that you want so just ask. Yeah. We got it. What would you do if Tech Deck never existed, and how much of an impact does fingerboarding have on you and the world? Um, yeah, so Tech Deck is, like, awesome because it's an intro level to fingerboarding, where anyone can afford one and pick one up anywhere in the country or in the world practically, and for three dollars you can try fingerboarding and see if you like it. And then if you like it, you can go buy a better one at some point. So Tech Deck is awesome. They definitely are, like, they paved the way in that sense of just getting it everywhere. Fingerboarding has a huge impact on me personally. It's my whole entire life. It's everything I do. It's most of the people that I know are from fingerboarding. So it's huge. And a lot of people will say similar things and it just brings happiness to, to a lot of people. Have you ever experienced burnout with fingerboarding? Have you ever taken a long break? I feel like the longest break I've ever taken what might be a few days and like not on purpose at all. So probably like two days at the most because occasionally a day will go by where I'm like, oh, I didn't fingerboard, but it's pretty rare. Even just like doing one kickflip or something, like I'm always fingerboarding at least a tiny bit, but usually more. Um, I think there's like periods of it being like you know, being more motivated to film or less motivated to film, but there's always like at least a small amount of fingerboarding going on and usually a lot of fingerboarding going on, for sure. If you could tell yourself when you started fingerboarding, what would it be? So I'm assuming he means like if you could tell yourself something, what would it be? So, um, I don't think I would tell myself anything, you know, because it worked. That's like such a good ending. This is over. I'm done. That's all the questions. <laughs>